ke aloha, aloha kakahiaka kako. Uh, emphasis on the kakahiaka part. Um, can we just, I just want to recognize um, Hina for a moment. Um, I was thinking back as she was talking about myself at her age. I remember um, I was an athlete, pretty much what I cared about. I did get into college and I majored in track and field. <laughs> um, I remember being here in Waianae, I came and had a, an interview for a scholarship and they told me talk about yourself for about 15 minutes and I talked about myself for about 15 seconds. I was just like clueless, I didn't know what was going on. Um, I like to think I've come away since then, but um, just imagine what the future is looking like with um, young people like her uh, at the Vanguard. Um, how about give it up for her? And uh, I teach high school seniors, so that's an uh, age group that's pretty um, in my mind most of the time. Um, uh, Ilima's presentation was did kind of have a segue into mine um, as a Kamehameha teacher. Um, I'd like to say we no longer have eugenics for young people. <laughs> <laughs> or do we? <laughs> Because um, recently in the union newsletter, I wrote a piece that uh, the, they put out a question of what would a world-class Hawaiian institution look like? And my first point was we would no longer have in our mission um, the words Hawaiian culture and SAT scores within the same sentence, which is what we have. Um, the SAT, I don't know how many people know this, but it was created by a eugenicist who disavowed the test on his deathbed. And it somehow would just sort of go along and keep using this test. Um, if, if there were no effects, that might be okay, but there's a one standard deviation difference in SAT scores between um, whites and minorities. And the reason SAT score is in our, uh, our five-year plan is that uh, that's like our constant uh, Achilles heel can't really get it up and I'm saying maybe we should rethink the whole thing I mean Britain has a pretty good education system with no SAT scores I mean it's some kind of miracle they've magically figured out how to do uh, you've heard of Oxford you've heard of Cambridge and they do all of that without any SAT it's amazing so maybe we could start to move away like um, Hampshire College was the first and about 20 of the very top schools in America have now become SAT optional. And so what I'm saying is maybe Kumameha should also become uh, SAT optional and break that final link from the eugenics movement uh, because this stuff is deep. And so that's actually what I wanted to um, start out with in a way. Um, it's not only Kumameha. You know, I'm a graduate of political science at UH and the building that we're in used to be called Porteus which was changed to Saunders because Porteus was himself a eugenicist and was the author of a book called A Century of Social Progress in Hawaii. You can kind of imagine what that's about, <coughs> that progress that he's referring to. Um, so what, what would they like to see? I, I was planning on my presentation and, um, and then just a few days ago, I happened to be reading, uh, of all things, some American poetry that, that's what I do. Um, and I came across this poem here called The Indian Student or Force of, Na Force of Nature by Philip Freneau. I won't read the whole thing, but I will read parts of it. Um, it's actually about a Native American boy who uh, the chief or leader of his tribe thinks that uh, he might benefit from a Western education. And at that time, Harvard had just opened as a school that was actually for the colonial and Native American uh, children of that area. Uh, actually, the, the colonials were uh, graduates of Boston Latin School, which is an exam school, um, somewhere for them to go after they graduated from that school. And then they had a Native American part. That, that Native American building still stands. Um, so this. Uh, uh, chief, we might say, says, um, why detain so fine a lad? 
why not give him a, a, head, uh, a step up in the Western world that's encroaching? In white man's land, there stands a town where learning may be pursued low, purchased low. Um, it was very affordable back then, not like now. Um, exchange his, blank, his blanket for a gown and let the lad to college go. Sorry, my mother's trained to, to read poetry, me not so much. Um, so the council decided, um, and viewing Shalom's tricks with joy, to Cambridge Hall or Wastes of Snows, they sent the copper colored boy. Some thought he would in law excel, some said in physic he would shine, and one that knew him passing well beheld in him a sound divine. He had a good singing voice. Uh, but those of more discerning eye, even then, could, even then could other prospects show, and saw him lay his virtual by to wander with his dearer bow. The tedious hours of study spent, the heavy molded lecture done, he to the woods a hunting went, through lonely wastes he walked, he run. No mystic wonders fired his mind, he sought to gain no learned degree, but only sense enough to find the squirrel in the hollow tree. And it goes on more to say that he basically leaves Harvard and goes back to being a regular Native American, that the lure of Western education doesn't really uh, grab him. Um, this really grabbed me, this poem. I, I was just, uh, as the millennials would say, mind blown by this. <laughs> Partly for personal reasons, because uh, I recently wrote a short story. I, I do a lot of different things, and it was in Hawaii Review. Uh, it's called The Breach, and it's going to be reprinted in Summit Magazine. And it's about the same idea, except with a Hawaiian, uh, who happens to be my mother's cousin. My mother's cousin was a Kamehameha grad of the class of um, 1957, and he went to Harvard, which in the 50s to go from Kamehameha to Harvard was, was almost unheard of. It, it was really very much a pioneer uh, in terms of uh, being able to make that leap. And as someone who, I've been at Kamehameha for 16 years, and having gone to Harvard, I, could, I sort of tried to imagine and get in his head what that culture shift would have been like. And uh, it turns out that he does not finish. And, he, and that, that culture shock is a bit too much because we're not talking about just going to the mainland. We're talking about the Eastern, East Coast establishment elite. Um, and how do, you, how do you get into that? It's the same idea that I see here that the native can never quite assimilate fully. Never fully. You can get to where you're passable can never get to where you are the equal of the elite in their own culture. So that's something that um, I've sort of ruminated about a lot and, uh, and struggled with a bit. Um, so I kind of pre I'm kind of presenting that poem as uh, this is the American view of indigenous education um, that you're only going to get them to a certain point. The idea of being good and industrious, that's in our, uh, the will, Hawaii, right? Good and industrious, we're not talking about um, the next Einstein, we're talking about a good contributing member of American, or, uh, well, kingdom society, which then got supplanted to American. Well, what, so that's in America. What about in Hawaii? Um, I came across an old, Educational Journal from 1981, and one of my former professors, uh, Manfred Henning, really put it well. He said, most newcomers to these islands have no idea how viciously and recklessly the, colon the colonial mind has hovered over Hawaii. It penetrated all relationships and was perpetuated and reinforced by the churches, the schools, business, law, the military, the news media, literature, and certainly the university. So as a Kind of a foreigner from Germany, I think you could see the uh, the sort of colonial uh, imposition clearer than someone coming from the one who's doing it. In that same journal, I saw 
a quote from a Territorial Commission report. Um, when Hawaii was supposedly annexed in 1898, there was a question about uh, how we're going to Americanize. And the territory's response to that was kind of captured in this quote. The present public school system in Hawaii is very satisfactory, satisfactory and efficient, and very advantageous to the US. English should be the language of universally taught. No system could be adopted which would tend to Americanize the people more thoroughly than this. So that pretty much sums it up that uh, they had uh, a system of indoctrination. Um, Laakea already referred to this. And maybe Keanu mentioned this quote, but I, I really can never get over it. A Bishop of State trustee saying, if we are to have peace and annexation, the first thing we must do is to obliterate the past. Uh, this is in the period after the overthrow, but before annexation. So that's why he's saying, if we are to have peace and annexation, no rebellions, uh, but get the outcome that we want. We must obliterate the past. And this obliteration of the past was quite successful. Um, and it's sort of been my uh, my crusade, you might say, to undo this obliteration. And I've been trying to pursue it through different channels, not just not just in the classroom. Um, I have Americanization with a question mark here because was it Americanization or was it simply denationalization? Um, Keanu Sai has brought up this uh, picture before of uh, Ka'iulani Elementary School, they're pointing to the flag and um, chanting our uh, one country, one language, one flag. So speak English, the language of America. Um, and uh, earlier in the quote, the, the last quote that I mentioned, it said it will, um, this education system will sort of uh, unite the different ethnic groups under the one identity of America. Um, in the meantime, erasing the prior nationality. And even the, the word nationality, right? We grew up with the sense of uh, locals, we say what's your nationality, when we really mean what's your race. Um, we think Hawaiian means race, when originally it's, it's nationality. That's why Pawahi says in her will, financial aid will be given to those Hawaiians of Aboriginal blood. Well, right there, that means there are some Hawaiians without Aboriginal blood, right? The Haole who have nationalized or were born here. Um, so we don't know, we don't know really who we are. We think that we're this one thing and we're another thing. Uh, even the name of the islands, right? Hawaiian islands, it's just a bad translation of ko Hawaii pai aina. Ko, possessive. Not Hawaiian islands, Hawaii's islands. The islands that were conquered by the kingdom of Hawaii, the island of Hawaii. Um, that's what Kanaia Opuni is about. We say state of Hawaii, <laughs> Hawaiian islands. That's not what it was supposed to be. We, we have this deep, deep uh, confusion about baseline things, and that's why the issue of sovereignty is so important. What about today? <laughs> I just decided to go full, full bore and quote Kenneth Conklin. Um, I'm pretty involved in the textbook issue. Uh, I've been working on it, my own textbook for a while, because I think the, the textbook that's currently used is problematic, um, but so does Ken but in the opposite direction, right? All students in Hawaii public schools are required to take a course on the modern of Hawaii before they graduate. As a result of the history twisting and victimhood mentality spawned by this course, thousands of teenagers and young adults now feel rising levels of anti-Americanism and anti-Caucasian racial resentment. How did this sad, sad state of affairs come about? Okay. History twisting? Really? Um, certainly no educators would ever deliberately mislead us. Um, 
I also came across this uh, book by Andrew Sharp, Ancient Voyagers in Polynesia. This is in the 50s, actually 1963. <coughs> and it says here, this underlined part, a little thought will show that all the distant ocean islands in the world must have been encountered in the first place by accident and not by deliberate navigation to those islands. Navigation implies the existence and location that one's objective is known and, of course, set for it. Uh, this was, obviously, we know this, this now not to be true by all of the voyages that uh, Hokulea and other uh, have done, especially Malamahonua, and yet, here it is. And if you look in the book, there's all kinds of amazing, really um, impressive charts, diagrams, and he has a PhD, so must be true, very convincing. <laughs> and now we know this to be <coughs> absurd. In fact, Andrew Sharp, um, there, there's another Andrew Sharp who's still active today. He's an academic, a professor and, uh, he, in New Zealand, and he was at a symposium once, and he came up and he introduced himself, oh, I'm Andrew Sharp, and the Maori guy punched him out. <laughs> they thought that was the risky this <laughs> one. Um, but they now know that this was propaganda, um, that it was simply untrue. So I bring this up because often I even find myself questioning, is, is, is what I'm saying really true? And so I've looked at it backwards, forwards, upside down, inside out. Um, to try to see, I, I want to make sure that I'm not um, just doing the same thing in the, in the reverse direction. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. I put together a timeline of education in Hawaii, cause, mostly because I thought I was going to be first. <laughs> but um, it was actually more difficult than, than I thought. I looked at some different timelines and nobody could quite agree when different things appeared. There's not a really comprehensive timeline yet, and this, this is not one either. Um, and I'll give some examples of, uh, of that in, uh, along the way. So my alma mater, La Luna, 1831, it actually predates the public education system, but I didn't know until recently that it, was, it emerged from the Stockton Institute. The Stockton Institute was founded by Betsy Stockton, who was the first African-American in Hawaii. And so Lahaina Luna is created from that, which is more like, a, more like a university or a seminary kind of graduate school. Than, it's not a high school at the time. Punahou 10 years later, or Oahu College, and in that same year, the public education system is created by uh, Kumamana III. Uh, in 1846 was uh, College of Ahui Manu, um, because after the Laplace affair, uh, France almost overthrew Hawaii, they said you better stop discriminating against, against Catholics, and they said, okay, okay we we'll give you some land out in the boonies, two days trip, two days voyage from um, from, from Honolulu. You know, Twenty minutes now, but then later <laughs> moved, later moved to uh, Kaimaki. Uh, my favorite discovery was that um, Iolani was founded in. Well, what became Iolani was founded in 1863, and um, one of my best friends in Kaikahasi is a graduate of Iolani, and I got to tell him last night that originally it was called Lahaina Lalo. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was a tremendous amount of satisfaction. <laughs> um, and a few years later, St. Andrew's Priory, and I've been having a bit of talk. My wife is the uh, principal of St. Andrew's Priory having talks with uh, her and the, and the head of school about um, getting the word out that St. Andrew's Priory is one of the oldest, uh, most historic schools in Hawaii. And, um, they're, they're having kind of an admissions um, crisis, you might say. Um, so all of these schools predate the overthrow, including Mid-Pacific in a sense, um, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so what I just want to point out here is that you know, most of the schools that people are wanting to go to, the competitive ones, you know, doing all, going all through these um, uh, things to, to get their kids into are all kingdom institutions, you know. 
Kamehameha. <laughs> 1887. See, I always tell my students, your, your shirt says 1887 because that's the bayonet constitution, so you can get that answer correct on the quiz. It's not the spawn of the school. It's a history thing. Um, 1896, most people know as Hawaiian language ban, or what some people point out is the English mainly policy. It wasn't a direct ban, it was a... Uh, just said that English would be the primary uh, medium of, of education in the schools. Uh, 1908, when the Pacific is formed, but it's formed from two institutions of girls and boys. Uh, Mills Institute was actually founded in 1893, so Kingdom as well, and they become mid, mid, mid pack in 1908. Um, then you have a long blank period during which my grandparents and my parents are Growing up, uh, my mother went to Marinol, which was founded in 1927. Um, my grandmother's born in 1910 and never talked to me about the overthrow ever, which I find very, very strange. Um, and then, but things start to happen in the 70s, 1981, the Hawaiian Studies Program, which mainly starts with the Kupuna Program, and then Punanaleo in 1984. Kaiapuni, uh, Hawaiian version in 1986, and not till Hawaiian, not till 2015 is there a person appointed to be the head of Hawaiian education in uh, OSIS, right? Um, so within this timeline, somewhere uh, certain Hawaiian history knowledge gets sublimated, it gets uh, buried. The one that I am very uh, engaged with is the question of, is Hawaii an occupied state? If it is, then it has to have a start date, and that would be August 13, 1898. So that is coming up uh, 120 years now of occupation. So um, I actually teach, one of the courses that I teach at the Matsunaga Institute at UH is a course on military occupation. It's one of the only courses like that in the world. Because usually occupation is about two classes, two days within a course on international law. But I've kind of created a class entirely, no, I didn't create it. Kuhio Vogler created it and I inherited this course on occupation. And so I could stand here and say that the University of Hawaii now accepts that occupation, that Hawaii's occupied, but that would be making it too simple because for one thing my boss is Barack Obama's sister so there's some implications there right if Hawaii is occupied what does that mean about Obama and his presidency you'd be the judge um, and then the previous director uh, publicly came out against this point of view even though we have a class in our department so so it's more complicated than just UH accepts uh, or even Matunaga Institute accepts the idea of occupation. Um, there is some acceptance uh, internationally and, and within Hawaii, and I think that's why some of us are here, but it's still a point of contention, right? Um, the, the idea of the illegality of the overthrow is a settled historical issue, right? The Apology Law, 1993, basically is a confession that's not forced. Right? The Hawaiians didn't take their army in 1993 to Washington and force Bill Clinton to sign that document. It was voluntary. So they said they did it. We said they did it. We all agree like a big happy family. Overthrow is illegal. That's settled. And people think, oh, what does the apology law really do? It doesn't give us any land. But to me as a Hawaiian history teacher, that thing is huge. I can talk about the overthrow as being illegal and it's not even controversial, except for about five guys on the internet. <laughs> um, but annexation somehow is still controversial, which is very weird because if, if the overthrow is illegal, doesn't it simply follow that annexation is illegal? I mean, in law, there's the idea of the fruit of a poison tree. If the tree is poison, you can't, the fruit's not going to be something you can eat, right? So if um, the annexation is the outcome of the overthrow, then it's simply illegal by default. But never mind that. It's illegal on its own terms as well, which I, I won't talk about too much because probably people know about that. But um, this is one of those things I'm always going over. 
backwards and forwards. Well, what is our current textbook, or at least a textbook before the very most recent textbook, what does it say about annexation? Simply, in August 1898, Hawaii was officially annexed to the United States and became the territory of Hawaii, period. Um, this is simply not true. The, the uh, AP U.S. history textbook is, uh, is better than the Hawaiian history textbook in the sense that uh, at least it mentions that there was a resolution, not a treaty. And so how do we come to think that, uh, how do we get to the point where we're sort of questioning ourselves? Like, is this true? We've been told this, but it doesn't seem to be true. Well, propaganda. Um, I would say mainly Kaikendal. Uh, think about it. The guys who overthrew the kingdom hired a guy to write the history of the kingdom that they just overthrew. And they gave him 30 years to do this full time. And so all the subsequent histories until very recently are based on that because he's the one who had the time to look at every document and create the story. The, the, the baseline narrative of Hawaiian history in the Kingdom period. Three volumes, about 1,500 pages. Um, but the origin of that is problematic, right? He's hired by the oligarchy to write that history. He can't read Hawaiian. He looks at no Hawaiian documents. Um, he doesn't have a PhD. His specialty is California history. Um, so there are some questions about his, uh, his uh, qualifications to be writing this, but he did put in the time and the work. Um, the problem is that it's a, it's a one-sided narrative. Um, and there are some other more subtle signs of propaganda, like the statue in front of McKinley High School that's holding a treaty of annexation, which doesn't exist. Sanford Dole and Lauren Thurston put up that statue when they changed the name from Honolulu High School to McKinley High School. So, or I'm always asking the question, how do we know this is true? Is it true? Um, there's the case in the world court. Is that a form of verification? Um, it seems that it is. Uh, that, that the court is simply not accessible by individuals. Like if me and someone in this audience had some kind of fist fight, that would never end up in the world court. It just simply wouldn't. Right? Because that's um, two individuals, it's not a country. And so that uh, admission into the world court is a kind of a tacit recognition that Hawaii is uh, still, in fact, a country. So I think um, what, we're, what we're coming up with is uh, two kind of diverting or divergent narratives. One, all, all stemming from annexation. If annexation is legal, then the logic has to go this way. If it's illegal, it has to go this way. And the person who kind of summed it up best was John Osorio, I think, in a, in a little red book, but a, a good book people should look at, Law and Empire in the Pacific. He says, the strategies of both Kalahui Hawaii, which is a Fed rec um, proponent, and the Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom, that's Keanu Sai's group, uh, require their own articles of faith. One side places faith in the rituals of law, that's Council of Regency, the other believes in the importance of ancestry and ethnic distinction. A lot. I think that kind of sums it up. Um, so I think I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm just going to uh, get to the, the, the takeaway which uh, Ilima, I, I actually wrote down Ilima's words, word for word here, in quotes. She says, you got to learn our history. That's what she said. And um, so the question is how? How do you learn it? Right now, there aren't, uh, there hasn't been a synthetic Hawaiian history text since Shoal of Time. Uh, Gavin Dawes, 1969. So there hasn't been a history book for adults um, in 50 years. So uh, that's the kind of thing I think about. That's how I spend my days <laughs> ruminating over how to address that. 
Um, I'm in kind of uh, informal talks with UH Press about <coughs> producing a, a replacement for Shoal of Time from a Hawaiian perspective, hopefully. Uh, but there's so much to be done, and this is where educators come in. Um, the question, how are you going to learn our history, it's, it's very difficult right now. You have to sort of piece together the story from different sources that are reliable, but most of them are only reliable for a certain time period. And so that's very difficult. Plus, um, putting it into context is another challenge. So um, that's where historians come in, and that's where we get into the structural problems in the Hawaiian history field. Uh, there are really only two to four uh, actual professors of Hawaiian history in the world right now. We're talking two at Manoa, Noe Arista and John Rosa. One for the 18th, uh, 19th century, one for the 20th century. And then you've got one at UH Hilo and one at West Oahu. Um, and so do they have a lot of time to publish? Uh, that's not a lot. If you compare that to US history, it's, it just doesn't compare. Right? There's thousands of scholars in that field. And so we're working with um, very few real specialists. That's one of the problems. And then when you bring it down to the school level, there's an issue of, you know, how do you pass the praxis and learn the history both? It seems to me that's a, that's a predicament. You can either pass the praxis and you're not going to know Hawaiian history very well, right? Because praxis is 40% history, none of that's Hawaiian history. It's got the economic section, it's got geography people struggle with. Uh, you're going to be studying those things. Or you know Hawaiian history well and you can't pass the praxis. Or you pass the praxis and then you start learning the history. Problem there is that the average teacher lasts about five years and then they leave the profession. Um, so there's all these uh, structural problems in the, in the field. Um, so yes, you got to learn your history, but um, as a, as a community, we need to make that easier for people because right now it's it's uh, it, it really asks too much of people to do that. Um, I had a lot more that I could have talked about, but I think I'm out of time, and I'd like to leave at least a minute for questions. So, mahalo nui. Any questions? Are we completely out of time? My hila hila. I'll just say one more thing. Um, so I'm probably the most comfortable person here with awkward silences. <laughs> is that um, uh, originally I met Laakea because he called me. Um, I had written a blog post. I have a blog that's um, interesting story there. Uh, it, it took off because um, the advertiser didn't write anything about the overthrow on January 17, 2012. So people start Googling and they find a little thing that I wrote about the overthrow. My blog is called the Umiverse. Get it? I never, I, ne I never would have called it that. It's just a joke. Um, if I knew, if I know that it would take off, it's over 125,000 views now, because people are out there wanting to know about Hawaiian history. Mostly, I read about Hawaiian history. So, um, Laakea read one of my blog posts, which was called "The Need for a Hawaiian College," and uh, you know, so that brings up the question: What about UH? Um, UH on its founding in 1907, the, the speech at the founding. The president, I think it was, said, this is a school for the white community of this territory. Um, and I won't, I won't judge UH, but uh, I'll, I'll just quote who, somebody who's the most, probably the most, one of the most important and productive scholars of my generation, Kehaulani Kawanui. She said to me, UH is a colonial institution through and through. And so what a lot of people like, People like Ilima have been trying to do is fix this institution, make it work for us, but uh, are we ever going to get there? Or do we need to just create our own institution? So I just wanted to put that out there when, um, when Laakea said we need a Harvard of Hawaii. 
I was definitely resonating with that. Um, I just want to put that out there in people's minds. And I think the capacity is there, uh, which kind of Yanima alluded to a bit with the, uh, the trusts and so on. So that's it. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Are we talking about independence? Yeah, so my students always ask me that. My, my view is we have to develop the human capital. Now, right now, what, what I'm seeing is that we have Hawaiians um, broadening out into a lot of different fields. We have Hawaiians in the sciences, which you never used to see. Um, if Hawaiians, uh, I have a student who's at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard studying public policy. That, that's new. It used to be history, Hawaiian studies, kind of, we always went into that. Um, so the broadening is starting to happen. But to use a sports meta, a metaphor, there's no depth. We've got a few people in a broad field, but we need a deeper bench. Everybody say, yes, coach. <laughs> yes, coach. <laughs> so that's, that's my view. We need to get that depth in the, in the breadth of the field so that people can do all the things that you need to run a society for ourselves. That's what needs to happen. So that's why education comes in. You need those qualifications. Yeah. Okay. Mahalo, Nuya, Oko.